So let's begin. So with FlyQ EFE, uh, you may notice that there are actually two icons on the screen that say FlyQ. The orange one on the far right-hand side of the screen is FlyQ Insight, which is our free product. We're not going to talk about that today. We're going to use the one that says FlyQ EFB, which is the magenta icon um, on the bottom towards the left side. So I'll tap on that. The system automatically turns on. Let me do one thing first. Okay. The system automatically turns on, and it uses a GPS on your iPad, if your iPad has a GPS, to lock on to your position. The way that I'm going to do the presentation tonight is to kind of go over in order of what's on the screen. So I'll talk about things that are on the map. I'll talk about things that are at the very top of the screen. I'll, top, I'll talk about the various tabs. However, before we do any of that, I want to show you how you can get additional help after the presentation. So if you take a look at the top bar on the screen here, there's um, a number of icons next to where it says search for airports. There's one that looks like a lock, one that looks like kind of a brightness control, one with a down arrow. Next to uh, a couple over from that is one that looks like a gear. I'm going to press the one that looks like a gear. In fact, before I do that, I want to try something. Um, I'm going to see if this works. Um, hang on for a second. I want to try showing things. Okay, so maybe this will work now. One of the complaints that people have had from some of our other presentations is simply that it's uh, very difficult to see where it is that I'm clicking. And I see that is still an issue. Maybe you can see the mouse pointer on the screen. I don't know. But I'll just describe where things are. At any rate, my mouse pointer right now um, happens to be, I'm moving it as we speak. Here we go. OK. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the icon that looks like a gear towards the top of the screen. This is your settings. The reason why I'm bringing up settings is because I want to show you how you can get additional help after the presentation. We put the help at the very top of settings. The first choice tells you what's new in each release of the product. The second one, though, is probably uh, more useful for people just getting started. It says technical support and help right over here. So I'm going to tap on that. And then you have a number of choices. You have videos, which is our YouTube channel. You can get to the pilot's guide, which is our printed documentation, uh, ADSB, primer, FAQ, and so on. I'm going to go to the videos, though because the videos brings you directly to our YouTube channel on, uh, well, on YouTube. YouTube um, has uh, 72 or more videos. In fact, I think as of last night, 73 videos about Flycube. So as you move up, you can see the ones we uploaded. For example, this is under the uploads category here. We have webinar advanced Flycube EFB. So 66 people have seen it in the last five hours. All the other uploads that we've done in chronological order, it has different categories also. So, for example, there's a category about FlyQ at B3.0. It's a whole category about our web-based flight planner, FlyQ Online. These are fantastic uh, videos for getting started. These are the seven-day challenge tutorials. The seven-day challenge tutorials are all under about 10 minutes, or at least almost all of them, under 10 minutes. And they cover various categories of uh, tasks. For example, the first video here really is called The Basics. That one goes over in a very condensed way, much of what I'm going to talk about here today. So it tells you how to move the map, tells you how to zoom in, download data, create a flight plan, uh, and so on. Downloading data is another one. You can get airport information, and so on. So these are a really good series of videos for if you're just getting used to the product and getting started. We call that the seven-day challenge tutorials. And again, if you're just getting started, you're probably getting a video once a day from us in email that has these. If not, just go to the YouTube page on the screen. Okay, so I'm going to go back to FlyQ itself now and go over what's actually in today's presentation. So the first thing about FlyQ that you have to understand is it's what computer people would call a very flat design, meaning we went out of our way to minimize the number of taps to get to information. In fact, we call it something. We call it the rule of two. The rule of two means that you should never have to tap more than twice, preferably never or one time, to see the information that you need while you're flying. Now, if you're not flying, say you're downloading data or something like that, it's okay to take more than two taps. But we really want to make sure that, this is a phrase that we use a lot and, and one that we really believe in, we want to make sure that you are flying the plane, not flying the iPad. 
I don't know about you, but I've seen an awful lot of folks who, when they're flying around, they're spending a lot more time looking at their iPad, clicking buttons, than they are looking out the window. We don't think that's a great thing to do. So this rule of two that we have um, is really focused on minimizing your time spent looking at an iPad. Consequently, the way that you get around the product is very simple. Right now, uh, we obviously have the map on the screen. If I tap anywhere in the map, a bar appears down the bottom of the screen. That bar is our tab bar. It has the main categories. It goes away automatically. You can tell it to stay uh, permanently if you like, and if you have a larger iPad, that can be useful. But for a lot of people, um, once you go to a map or you go to an approach procedure or you go to airport info, you want to look at it for a long time and not see a clutter um, of seeing a tab bar, so it goes away. The main categories are airports, like this, weather, and I'll show you a lot more detail, obviously, about all of these um, as we go on. But weather information, flight planning, back to maps, of course, the scratch pad lets you scribble things on the screen, procedures, and then documents. So there's a lot of things here. So to get back from anywhere to anywhere, like getting back to maps, I'm just going to hit the button that says maps down the bottom. Sorry, it's a little hard to do this with highlighting at the same time. I'll hit the maps button down the bottom and I'm back at the map. In about two seconds, the tab bar will disappear automatically. There you go. Okay, so let's talk about what it takes to move the map. Moving the map is pretty much like any other iPad application. You take one finger and you can move it left, you can move it to the right, back again, up and down, all the basics. If you take two fingers, you can squeeze the map in. If you pull your fingers apart, it zooms out. You can also take two fingers and just rotate, which is what I'm doing right now, okay? So a couple of things there, that's zooming. Now you may say though, well, that, that's nice, but mainly what I wanna do is I want to have the system track what I'm doing when I'm flying the plane. So I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna turn on the simulator. Um, the way that you do that is going a little out of sequence. So I'm not gonna explain this quite yet, but I'm just turning on the flight simulator that we have. Uh, so you can see some movement. So at this point, the system thinks that I'm flying an airplane. That's why we went from a dot being on the screen to being an aircraft icon. The reason, by the way, why uh, you only see a dot when you're not moving and you see an aircraft icon when you are moving is because when you're not moving, we don't really know which way you're pointing. We calculate which way you're heading by your last position versus your current position. That gives you your track, as or. Anyway, so now we're taking off in the Seattle area from Payne Field. If I were to move the map someplace really far away, like let's say I wanted to zoom down to Florida or something like that, and I wanted to now to go back to where I was before, Take a look at, there's a gray button bar on the left-hand side of the screen. On the iPad, that's on all the time. On the iPhone, with a smaller screen, that disappears after six seconds also. But on the iPad, like this, there's a number of icons on the screen. Beginning at the top one is one that looks like a stack of paper. That controls layers. I'm gonna do that last. I'll talk about that in a second. But below that is an icon that looks like a targeting site. Tap on that, and the map, um, zoom, the map moves to your current location. If you tap it again, it zooms into your location. Below the targeting, and then if, of course if you move it again, notice that the track lock icon, so this is the track lock icon, that one is now white, meaning it's not on. So if I move it to wherever, and I tap it, I center on my current location, tap that button a second time, and I zoom in. Now, if I, like a lot of people, and I prefer to think about left and right versus north and south, so I want to see track up mode, that's what the icon just below there does. It's the one that looks like a compass rose. So I'm going to tap on that, and now the aircraft icon moves towards the bottom of the screen, and it's continuously now, no matter which way I'm flying, the aircraft will stay at the bottom, and the map moves so that you're always looking at the screen from a track up perspective. Below that icon, is a button that looks like a cube. In some other products that you may have used, you may find that uh, there's a difference between the synthetic vision view and the map view. They're two totally different objects. From our perspective, they're not. They're both maps. The question is, is it a 2D map like this one or a 3D map? So you can toggle any map uh, from 2D to 3D and back again by tapping the button that looks like a 3D cube. 
So now I tap on that, and now we're flying in 3D space. Very simple. So then, of course, you may say, well, how do I get back to 2D? Well, you do that by, I'm hang on for a second, I'm actually picking up my iPad for a second. So I tap on that cube a third time, and it moves to what we call the synthetic vision view, or rather um, augmented reality view. So in the AR view, obviously I'm not flying right now, I'm at my desk, but the camera, as you move it around the cockpit or your office, it has icons pointing to the airports where they would be. This is the only application that does this. It's called augmented reality. So now I'm not really looking at a bookcase. I'm looking at an airport, which is Magenta 8W5. It's Magenta because it's uncontrolled. PWT doesn't have that little stick pointer. It just has the I it just tells you the ident, meaning it's kind of far away. As opposed to RNT and BFI, that's Renton and Boeing Field, uh, respectively. Those are 21 miles or 19 miles away, and they are controlled towers, so they are blue. You can also tap in the right corner, uh, lower right corner of the screen, what looks like an overview or a radar map. If you tap on that, you see the radar move around as you point. Okay, so if you tap anywhere on the screen, that uh, shrinks again. So the point is that there are three map modes. There's a 2D map mode, a 3D map mode, and an augmented reality map mode. So if I tap this now a fourth time, we go back to the 2D map. I'm also going to, by the way, tap the button to just go back into centering mode. The other button, oh, sorry, I'm actually holding the iPad right now. The other button that's on the screen um, that's on that left side toolbar looks like a gauge because it is. At the very top of, well, the, almost at the top of the FlyQ screen, there is a altitude readout that says 5300, a GS ground speed readout. These are over here. This is 85, track 167 degrees and so on. If you wanna get that off the screen, what you do is you go down to the button bar over here on the left-hand side, the very bottom one that looks like a gauge and you tap that and it goes away. Like many things in FlyQ, it's a toggle, meaning if you do it again, it reverses. So it does that. So very simple to do. All right, uh, the other button, I'm gonna talk in a little bit about the layers on the map, because uh, that's kind of a whole separate category. But let's talk about the stuff at the top of the screen. Another thing that's really nice about FlyQ EFB is the ability to look at the screen either like this, just one big screen with tabs between the major sections, or if you look in the very upper left corner of the screen, it's next to the search for airports box, um, it just looks like a rectangle with a line through it. That means split screen. So if I tap that, I suddenly see the screen split. At this point, I now notice I have tab bars down the bottom on one side of the screen and tab bars down on the other side. So I can put two totally different things on the screen. I could also do things like put a 2D map on one side. And if I hit the map button on the right hand side too, I can maybe make that a 3D map like this. So you can do 2D and 3D at the same time as you like. You can do augmented reality, uh, which is kind of cool at the same time, whatever you like to do. I'm just gonna bring that back to 2D. You can even do this. Um, I haven't taught, uh, told you about layers yet, but just so you get the concept here. So you could do, for example, an IFR map um, in track up mode on one side of the screen. And then on the other, you can do a VFR map from a totally different zoom level um, in north up mode. So you can really mix and match what you're doing. There's a lot of flexibility here. Okay, let's go back. Then if you wonder, well, how do I get back to single screen? Again, it's a toggle. So you go to the upper left corner of the screen, that button, it looks like a rectangle with a line through it, the split button. It's now blue, meaning split is on. So if I tap it again, split goes off. Okay, so very simple, very easy to do that. Next to the splitter is another common feature. We try to put the things that we think you're gonna hit commonly in one corner of the screen. So the split screen and the search are used very frequently. The status indicators over here on the, and I'll explain these in a little bit. The status indicators also get used frequently and so on. So we, there's a reason why things are in certain positions. So a really common function of course is the search. So inside search, you can do a lot of things there. It says search for airports. And indeed, I can type in, um, I lived in Kansas City for a while. So I could type in MCI, 
to pull up Kansas City, and I'll show you more detail on this uh, later. You can use it to pull up something like um, a fix, RP, and you can even use it to type in an entire flight plan, which again, I'm gonna do in a little while, but so you could type in flying from Payne Field in Seattle down to San Francisco, just like that. So the search button, the search box is very powerful. A lot of things that you can do with it, and we'll get into those um, in a little bit. The lock button is next to that. So let's say that you're flying in and you're very close to landing, and you wanna make sure that maybe you have an approach plate on the screen, and you wanna make sure that nothing goes wrong with the iPad, you don't hit it by mistake, it doesn't rotate on you, whatever. So what you do is you use this lock button right here, let's go padlock, and you tap on that, it turns blue, meaning it's on. You'll have to just trust me on this, but as I, I'm now touching my iPad screen quite a bit, I'm trying to move it, I'm physically picking up and trying to rotate it 90 degrees, nothing affects it. So the only button that works on, so the whole thing is active. If you look, the ground speed, the track, um, ETE, all of those things are mapped, they're all moving, the system's live, but you just can't tap anything on the screen until you click that blue padlock again to turn it off. And now I can move the map. Okay, makes sense? Next to that is a button that lets you do screen brightness. It lets you do radar opacity and procedure opacity. We'll talk about that later. Next to that is a very important button, which is downloading data. We will actually talk about that right now. So it looks like a down arrow because it lets you download stuff. So in this case, what we try to do with FlyQ is we think that the human brain works really well on visuals. Um, we've only known how to read for a few thousand years. So we try to minimize the amount of text on the screen and do things graphically wherever possible. So if you're coming at us from other products, you probably are used to an alphabetical list of all the different states that you can download data for. And that's lovely, I guess, if you're a geography whiz. But for most of the rest of us, if you have a flight plan, you may not know, let's say it's on the East Coast especially, or an area maybe that you haven't flown to a lot, you may not realize all the states that you go through. For example, see this magenta line here? We have a flight plan loaded. So we actually overlay the flight plan line on the download map. In fact, if you zoom in, you can really see my flight plan, okay? So we're flying, for, in this case, I have one loaded down to uh, Portland. Now, if you didn't happen to know that Portland was in Oregon, it's just across the border here, you may not realize that you need to download the data for Oregon. That's why we do this graphically, so you can see it. If you want a state's address, in FlyQ, we use a color coding system very consistently throughout the product. Green is good, red is bad, and either yellow or orange or somewhere in the middle. So right now, we have a number of states that are green, basically the West Coast and the Upper Midwest. They're green because we've downloaded the data for them. If we wanted to, let's say that we were doing a trip and we were actually going to Montana and Wyoming, I just tap on those on the map and they turn red. There's a key here, so it tells me, if I look at my key bar, it says red means expired or not downloaded, great. If I wanted to then download that data, I again go to my upper right corner, again, corners are important in FlyQ. I go to the upper corner and I hit update now. And in fact, I'll start doing that. So when I say update now, what it's doing is it's skipping all of the green states. It knows it already has that data and it's just downloading the new data they need for say Montana or for Wyoming. Very simple. And by the way, you can click, there's a done button to close that that you can click and you can still do it. But I wanna show you one other thing about downloading. You can pick different categories of data to download. So for all the items selected, like fuel prices or the FA diagrams or the Seattle avionics diagrams or VFR charts or IFR low charts, whatever, those are all selected as on. On the other hand, IFR high altitude charts and Gulf of Mexico charts and the helicopter charts here are all off. That's because most GA pilots don't need that data, so we turn it off by default. If you want to play with any of that data, just flick the switch on and off. And then for all the states that are selected, when you hit update now, uh, or it's, already, it's not there because we're already downloading data. When you click update now in the upper right corner, it'll download all the data that's missing for all the states that you have selected. I should also point out too, 
again, if you're really new to the product, the first time you download, it will definitely take longer than subsequent times because the system, first of all, it will download uh, one type of data that it only does once, and that's high resolution terrain data for all the selected states. So it won't have to update those most of the time. It also does what we call incremental updates for all of the things that are like approach plates. So once you download all the approach plates for a given state, the following month, it's not going to download all of the approach plates again. It's only going to download the ones that have actually changed. So the first time you download, it will definitely take longer. So if you just started using the product, you think, oh my gosh, this takes so long to download. Well, no, it really doesn't except for the first time. Okay, so enough about da downloading data. Other things along the top of the screen here, we are on uh, this button here. The one next to that looks like an aircraft taking off towards the middle of the screen. That's our pre-flight checklist. When you tap on that, it checks to make sure for the given type of flight required that your GPS works, your weather is current, and you have all the data downloaded that you need. If, for example, I was on a VFR flight and I didn't have VFR data downloaded, the line here that says VFR charts current would be red, not green, and would say VFR charts expired or not present or something. You may notice that the IFR charts in the middle here are gray. Um, I talked about green being good, red being bad. I didn't say anything about gray. Gray means not applicable. So in this case, I happen to have a VFR flight on the screen. So it doesn't matter if I have the IFR charts or not. That's not counted in the pre-flight checklist. Other things, this is the settings button next to that. It looks like a gear towards the top. And then next to that, we already showed you that a little bit. Next to that is a button that looks half black, half white towards the top. I'm gonna to tap on that and the screen changes to black and white, but it's actually not entirely black and white. I'm gonna cheat just a little bit, and turn on the map layer. So this is our TOS layer. Don't worry, I'll explain all the map layers in a second. So right now we're flying according to the gauge here at 5,500 feet, it's at the top left of the screen. And I'm in night mode. In night mode, it isn't like inverting all the colors. If you invert all the colors in your iPad, the orange or yellow, yellow meaning warning that you're close to the terrain, orange or reddish meaning that you are in fact below the terrain, you don't want to invert those colors. You don't want them to become green and purple or something. You want to make sure that red is red, yellow is yellow, orange is orange, green is green, but Anything that's basically black or basically white, you want to invert those colors. So we have a very smart way of doing night mode. So that, again, is the button that's highlighted now. It's a top middle of the screen. It looks like half black, half blue at the moment. Tap that off again, and it goes back to normal. I'm going to turn the TOS layer off now, too, for a second. Okay, so that's how a lot of that stuff works. Um, the other thing at the top that I should talk about is the status indicators. There are five indicators at the very top right of the screen. GPS is the first one, it's blue right now. Next to that is one that says WX weather. GPS blue means we're in simulator mode. Most of the time, it'll be green, uh, like the weather one next to it. Green means good, red means bad. So if the GPS is working properly, it will be green. If you lose your GPS for some reason, it'll turn bright red. We also try very hard not to draw your attention to things that aren't important. So for example, next to weather, which is green, meaning good, we have two buttons for ADSB. One just tells you whether or not ADSB receiver is connected. The other one uh, that looks, if you look really closely at the top, looks a little bit like a battery. That's an ADSB battery status. Those are not, you may think, well, I don't have ADSB connected, so shouldn't they be red? No, because in this case, we thought that if you're not flying with a GPS, you probably know it. So we don't want to draw your attention to the screen by always leaving something red on the screen that's meaningless. It's like the boy who cried wolf. We want to save a red indicator for a problem, for something going wrong. Consequently, if you connect an ADS-B receiver, it turns green. And then if for whatever reason that ADS-B receiver disconnects, then it turns red. Make sense? And the other button next to is a recorder. If you tap any of those five though, you can see details about all of those. So this gives you the details about the GPS. Right now we're using the simulator. So um, the simulator is really powerful. It lets you speed up things. Like if I want to fly faster, I can move at warp factor 10 on the simulator. I can jump using the slider down below that, my position on the route to anywhere on the map. 
That's kind of funny. So it's, there we go, on the map. I can even jump to a specific point. Like if I want to bring this to the, uh, say, battleground intersection, I can just tap on BTG. Right, the map centers itself. And now we're at battleground just before PDX. Okay. You can also pick different categories. That's the GPS info. You can check out weather. The weather gives you detailed information about how old each individual weather product that you have is, whether it's Nextrad or satellite, METARS or TAF, winds aloft. It also says now internet in parentheses. If you are connected to an ADSB receiver for the products that are available on ADSB, like Nextrad, but not satellite, that might say Nextrad, nine minutes old, ADSB. If you are connected to an ADSB receiver, which we will, will be in a little bit in the presentation, you'll see more data there and some flight recorder stuff. So we have some recorded flights and here they are for you. Okay, let's talk about the layers on the map. So that's a pretty big deal. So this, on the left-hand side, the button bar, the top one that looks like a stack of papers is the layers. I'm gonna tap on that. So the first thing is we break things down into categories. We have base map categories, which is on the left. Next to that, we have all the weather categories, a lot of those. We have the safety category with things like TFR and obstacles and TAWs. And then we have the other category of just other stuff. So for example, if I want to see sectionals, that's great, we're on sectionals. If I want an IFR low chart though, I pick the item below it, this is IFR low. Notice that the pop-up doesn't disappear. So at the same time, if I want to turn on radar, or if I want to turn on METARs and TAFs, I can do that. I don't have to keep hitting the button to bring up the pop-up. It stays up until I tap somewhere off the pop-up. So if I tap that stack of papers icon again, it pops up and shows me what's selected. So for example, I'm going to move off the screen a little bit and zoom out. I'm actually going to switch to a different base map. I'm going to switch to, uh, for the time being, the road map, only because it makes weather a little bit clearer. Less noise, basically, visual noise. So let's talk about some of the weather layers. Right now, we're looking at the radar. We also have an animated radar layer. Notice that this is the one case in the product where you can't have two different layers selected at the same time. You can't have radar, static radar, and radar animated at the same time. It just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So now the animated stuff is on the screen. I can also turn on my satellite infrared layer. So there you go. So you can see the satellite layer. I can turn on winds aloft. Let's zoom in a little bit and be a little more obvious what winds aloft are when you zoom in. All right, so now we're somewhere in California. And there are a couple of things to point out. Towards the middle of the screen, there's a red arrow that says 17 on it. The arrow is pointing basically to the north, maybe the northeast, 17. What does that mean? This is our winds aloft. This means at the altitude we are at right now, remember, this is a simulated flight. This, if you look at the altitude in the upper left corner, it says altitude 5,500. Consequently, the wind arrow is just pointing to the northeast, meaning the wind is going towards the northeast. It's a natural direction, we don't use wind barbs. We simply point in the direction that the wind is actually going. We also don't believe in what, uh, with a wind barb, I call it Roman numeral winds, because uh, you have to count the big bars versus little bars versus their triangular bars. Here we just say, the wind is 17 knots, pretty simple. It's color-coded green, meaning it's below 20 knots. So you know, even if you zoom out, I'm gonna zoom really far out, you can't see the 17 anymore. It would simply wouldn't fit on the screen, but it's green. So you can instantly see that even though you don't know the exact number, you know it's below 20 knots. Similarly, I'm gonna move this one into a line that says 26. The 26, it's over 20, therefore it becomes orange. So this is telling us that the winds at this point here are 26 knots hitting in the same general direction. If you're not flying, by the way, we show you what the winds look like for winds aloft at your default cruise altitude, not surface, uh, the default cruise altitude, unless you change it, being 7,000 feet. So it's so a question that comes up a lot. Other layers for weather. I'm gonna turn off a few of these right now. 
just to kind of uh, make it simpler. So I'm going to turn on air mats and segments. Actually, let's see if the METAR is on too. All right, so air mats and segments, I think visually are always the most fun to look at. They remind me of when my kids were little, when you played with little um, colored plastic toy, I mean really little, like babies, little colored plastic rings, and you when you overlay the colored plastic rings, you see how colors mix together. Anyway, I just thought it was cool. So the point here is that most of the time in the product, you double tap to see airport information. I'll show you that in a minute. But here, you have a lot of overlapping air mats and segments. So you wonder, well, how can I tell the difference uh, over Chicago, which one's which? Well, if I tap somewhere around the middle of the screen, Chicago, this pops up. It shows me a very cool diagram, pretty unique, very unique to the product. It's telling me that my altitude at the moment is around 7,200 feet. It's actually 6,000, but you know, something like that. And then there's a bl two blue boxes and an orange box, uh, and also a gray box over here. So what are those? That means when you take a look at the list here, there are four different air mets and sig mets. We don't think you should have to bother reading all of those to know what the altitudes are. So these bars here represent the altitude range of the air med and sig med. So for example, in this case, we actually, it's kind of unusual, whatever this first one is over here on the screen, um, that's below us. So I don't really need to worry about that at all. On the other hand, there are two blue boxes next to me. I can tap on the blue box. Oh, blue means icing, right. And if I tap on the one next to it, I see the other one. I'm going to move the map just a little bit because I want to show you something. So when I tap on those guys, I'm going to hit oh, a little different zone here, I guess. All right. So when I tap on the blue area, notice on the underlying base map below the pop-up, the only thing I see now is the blue one. If I tap on the red one, the only thing on the pop-up, the only thing I see on the base map is the red one. In other words, you can take, you can read the text, you can see that it's turbulence versus now icing. Um, and you also see the area clearly outlined on the map below it. In fact, you can even tap, there's a button there in the corner that says highlight. If you tap highlight, it closes the pop-up, but it leaves that thing on the screen. So you can see exactly where that is. By the way, to get back to seeing all of the all of the air mets and segments, just tap anywhere and they all come back, okay? So that's a lot to do with weather. There's also a lot more weather properties available on FlyQ Online, uh, which I probably won't have time to do during the presentation, but there it is. All right, uh, there's more stuff to do with the weather I'll talk about a little bit later, but I want to get back to some things about getting general information like airports and things like that. So I'm going to turn a lot of my map layers off, and I'm going to hit that button to recenter my map. So again, tap it once, centers it, tap it twice, and you're zoomed in. Great. So we're flying along now on the simulated flight. And let's say you want to see some information about the airport we're about to pass. It's a military base. You don't just tap on the screen. We do this intentionally because if you tap on the screen, you do that a lot when you're flying by mistake. We want to make sure that people don't make a mistake doing that. So we want you to be a bit more definitive. So if I want to know information about that airport in the middle of there, about McCord, I double tap on the screen. When I double tap, you get a lot of really interesting information popping up. First of all, you of course see the airport that's below the tap. So I know that this is McCord, it's ident is KTCM. It's a blue icon, what does that mean? Blue is just like blue on a sectional, meaning it's a controlled tower, as opposed to, there's no other airports in the area. But if there was an airport that was uncontrolled, it would be magenta. Below that is a green indicator that says VFR. That means, of course, that the weather conditions are VFR. Now, on an iPad or on a phone, you may not be able to read the word VFR, but green, good, red, bad. So green is VFR, uh, red is IFR conditions, and orange or yellow is a marginal VFR. Very simple. You also see all the other basic information to the airport, how far away it is from you, the maximum runway length, the TPA, you know, it's airspace class, and you usually see frequencies. There's also a series of four buttons down below. The four buttons are kind of shortcuts. So if you are flying along and you just want to go direct to that airport, you can click this button on the far left that looks like a, well, direct to button, a D with a line through it. If you want to add it somewhere else to your flight plan, you can hit the one next to that that says plus FP. Or in this case, this particular airport has approach plates. I know that because that third icon from the left, 
um, looks like the icon that we use for approach plates. So if I tap on that, I go immediately to the approach plates for that airport. Or if I want to center the map on this airport, I click the button on the far right side that looks like a map. If I click anywhere else in the cell, I see I just jumped, I'll just do this for a moment. I go to the general information page for that airport. And again, we'll talk about that in a little bit. If I want to get back to the maps, I just go down to the very bottom of the screen and I tap on maps like that. And now we're back at our map. I do though, I'm going to click on that again for a second because I want to show you something. So when you double tap on the map, you know, let me pick a different spot. Um, okay, so right now, it looks like we're coming in for landing, right? I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna use a simulator to back up just a little bit. All right, so I'm gonna move this to maybe there. All right, so if I double tap near Olympia, notice what we're seeing here on the screen. There's a display, It, it so I double tapped in the uh, left corner here over Olympia, so that's highlighted. But there's also an area that says airspace towards the top. What we do here is we translate the three-dimensional aspect of flying um, into a 2D display, meaning right now we're at about 1,500 feet. So we have a little icon on this graph telling us we're at 1,500 or so feet. We're flying low. The main thing is you can see that that icon overlaps is blue stuff, the blue bar, not the magenta bar or pink bar. So blue, as it says over here on the right, on the left-hand side, this is class D surface to 2000. Again, we do that as a graphical thing. We're really big into graphics. We don't make you try to read text to figure out what airspace you're in. Rather, we graphically show it to you using the same colors that you would see on a sectional. Okay, so a little bit about that. Let's talk about information that is specific to an airport. So I'm going to uh, go to an airport that I'm very familiar with, uh, my home airport. So just move the map back up here. Or actually, I'm not. I'm going to pick an airport closer to where we are. Tell you what, let's move our flight plan. And move this to, I'm going to actually load in the flight plan here for a second. So pretend, I'll show you how to do this in a second, but I just want to do something quickly. So I'm loading in the flight plan. I'm telling the simulator to play it. And I'm going to jump it to near the Seattle uh, VR. Hit the map button and go to it. Okay, so now we're flying along in the simulator flight and we're near Seattle. If I double tap on the map, it shows me airport information. So this is one way to get it. I could also type, if I want to know about SeaTac, um, I could type in, in the search box at the top, I could type SEA or double tap on the map. I'll just click that. Now, what's good about this is on one screen, we show you a lot of information. We don't have little buttons. For example, automatically you see the airport elevation, 432 feet, pattern altitude, maximum runway length, lighting schedule, sunrise, sunset, and uh, if it's an airport that has fuel prices, we won't bother for SeaTac, uh, you'd see that on the screen too. Below there, you have a satellite view, the Seattle avionics diagram that we'll talk about in a second, and the FAA diagram. If I tap on, say, the FAA diagram, you get the official diagram from the FAA for the 700 airports uh, that we actually have those diagrams for. The, the FAA only publishes 700 of them, but there are about 5,000 public airports in the country. So if I hit the SA diagram, we see the simplified Seattle avionics one, but this one also includes additional information telling you where all the taxis are and where the FBOs are. That may not be the best choice, so I'm going to pull up pain field by typing PAE at the top of the screen and show you that. So here we have the fuel prices and so on. And if I pull up the Seattle avionics diagram, you see where all the different FBOs are, where the terminals are, uh, Hilton Garden Inn, Museum of Flight, which is really good, by the way, um, and so on. By the way, you can even scribble on that. So there's a button that looks like a scribble, uh, looks like a magic marker at the upper left corner. If I click on that, I can now do something like, you know, circle that and say, my plane, like that on the map. Hit done, and there you go. Notice uh, that it's now on the screen like that. So if I hit that again, my plane. Okay, 
Looks like I did the same thing earlier with the FA diagram. The point here, though, is that on one screen, you get most of the information you need, you need to fly to without hitting additional buttons. So you see the comm frequencies and the runways, including right pattern versus left pattern, and the nearby nav aids. I'm simply taking one finger and flicking it up and flicking it down. Very simple, very easy to do. In other products that you may have used, you have a button for comm, you have a button for runways. And then to see details about a particular runway, you have to tap on that. It's a lot of tapping, a lot of clicking. This is where our rule of two comes in. So just to kind of back up a little bit here. Again, let's say it was on the map and I double tap on pain field. One tap, two taps to get to the airport and pretty much all the information you need to fly to is on the screen and took exactly two taps to get to it. That's what our rule of two means. Now, we do have some tabs though. There's a series, of, so this is our general info tab, but if you want to dive a little deeper into say weather, you can click on the weather tab and you see a lot of things quickly on the screen. You see a local radar map, a, a regional radar map and a national radar. You can tap on any of those to see them big. If you tap on say the regional one, um, that pops up. If you tap on local, those are animated, though nothing going on much. At the very top, by the way, it tells you what the current temperature is. It says it's cloudy outside, and it'll give you, this is kind of nice too, the seven day forecast. We don't have a moss uh, type forecast. Instead, we have a human readable one. So when you tap on the seven day forecast, it just tells you in plain English what the weather is gonna be like for the next seven days with icons describing it. So, you know, it's Seattle, looks like it's getting rainy. Tap off that or click done, and it goes away. On one screen for weather at the airport, we give you the METARs and we give you the TAFs. So if I were to tap on, by the way, um, in case you aren't say 23 years old and you have eyes like an eagle, if you were, in case you're say 51 years old and wear reading glasses, if you tap on the METAR anywhere in the text, it pops up in really big print, really easy to see. Tap off, do the same thing maybe with a TAF. You can scroll that of course to see that and so on. Very easy to do. Also on the same screen, we have all the winds aloft. Again, on other products, you often have a button for METARs, a button for TAFs, a button for winds aloft. Too many buttons, we don't believe in buttons. We think it's a lot easier to just take your finger and scroll. We even automatically pull up a Latos weather briefing that you can tap on and see it full screen. So very, very easy to do. Click done in the, in the corner to get rid of it. If you're flying IFR, next to, if you look at the tab bar along kind of the top of the screen, next to weather, we have procedures. So when I tap on procedures, I can pull up like the FAA airport diagram, go back to airports. I can pull up um, my ILS approach or RNAV approach. By the way, the sequence here is important. We first show you the diagrams, the general category, then we show you the approach plates, then we show you the arrivals and departures and minimums. Why? Because in other products that I've used, uh, you tend to have, because this is what a, a computer scientist thinks makes sense, you have an arrival before your approach, which makes sense unless you're flying a 172. If you're flying a 172, you're not flying a whole lot of arrivals, but you may be flying a lot of approaches. So we think, we try to put the things that you use the most on the screen so you don't have to scroll. So we think that you're gonna use the FA diagrams and the Seattle avionics diagrams a lot and the approach plates a lot. So you can get to those very quickly without having to scroll, okay? You have the full AFD for all the airports, jumps right to the uh, page as required. It's at the top here. If there are any NOTAMs for the airport, those are right there as well. You also have services available. So we show you all the uh, FBOs and fuel stops and so on. Uh, and incidentally, if you look at the fuel prices here and you say, well, I just went to Castle and Cook over here and they just changed their fuel prices. Great. Where it says in blue, tap to update. Blue, you can click on it, like on a web page. So if I tap on that, we go to the Seattle, uh, to the Castle and Cook uh, part of our website. You can just go in here and type over the new fuel price numbers and click the close button in the upper left corner and it'll be updated for everybody um, tomorrow. So very simple. You can also just click here on nearby and it shows you all the airports that are near the one that's selected. Very useful, um, especially if you're looking at things like fuel prices and so on, to find something that's cheaper. 
So that's airport information on here uh, a little bit. I want to talk a, a bit more about um, ADSB and about procedures on the map. Although for both of those, you can find a lot more detail on the advanced presentation that we gave uh, the other day. First, so let's just create a very quick flight plan. I want to show you how to do that. Then I'll show you how to pull up approaches, say, with it. So let's take a flight from Payne Field down to, say, San Francisco. I can do that. And if I hit the search box now, it will plan the flight out for me using my default routing method. Now, and I haven't changed it, so my default routing method is Victor Airways. So it's not just plotting a straight line between Payne and San Francisco. Instead, it's wind optimizing a flight plan and even finding me fuel stops. Like, if you look down here at this line towards the middle of the magenta icon, KRBG, that means that it had to plot fuel stops for me. And it plotted the fuel based on fuel prices not just on the most convenient for a computer to find, but it actually optimizes, minimizes your fuel cost. If I want to know something about that airport, because I've never heard of it maybe, I tap anywhere on the KRGB RGBG line, and it tells me there's Roseburg Regional, and I can see all the detail about the airport, and so on. So there's a lot of information to get to. Now you think, well, how do I get back to my flight plan? Well, remember it's flat. So I just go to the tab that says plans, and then back to exactly where I was on the plan. Very simple. Your weather briefing is also available just by hitting WX brief. And if you want to file that flight plan, you go to the next tab that says ICAO plan, and you just hit file. And of course, it says quite correctly that I don't have enough fuel to get there, so it gives me an error. But if you have your uh, account tied up to Lados, it will automatically log it into Lados for you, and you can use all the features on uh, the 1-800 weather site to get to it. Okay, let's look at um, an ADSB system. I want to do that very quickly before we run out of time. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. We actually have an ADSB simulator running in the background here, but I've told FlyQ to ignore it. So in a moment, you're going to see it. So there we go. So we now have ADSB on the screen. And the way that we do this is pretty cool. So right now we're flying, I think this is in uh, near Milwaukee. This is somewhere in Michigan, I believe, or Wisconsin. And as you can see, we have a problem right now because there's an orange icon right in front of us. Orange means warning. Bright red would mean really warning, really close to us. But we immediately see that the aircraft with the tail number N767DR is very close to us, but it says plus 20. Plus means above, 20 means 20 times 100 feet, so it's 2,000 feet above us. That's why it's orange. It's not quite super dangerous, but it's really close, so it's orange. As opposed to, right here at the top of the screen, we have a, have a plane N316TA, which is plus 215, which means it's 21,500 feet above us. And that plane has an indicator next to it with an arrow pointing up, meaning that it is climbing. If it were going down, of course, like, uh, must be some plane here. If it's going down, well, I don't see one. That's interesting. But if there were one that were down, you'd see a down arrow pointing on the screen. A couple of things to note also. There's a lot of traffic here. Now, if you think, well, that, that's nice to know where all the planes are, but frankly, if they're 20 miles away, who really cares? Well, it turns out what we have is a really easy to use filter. There's a ring right here. The ring, um, is set to a 15 nautical mile radius, and it says right above it, 15 nautical mile traffic filter off. So if you tap it, you turn the filter on. So I'm going to do that. I'll tap on it and watch what happens. Oh, look, all the things outside the ring disappear, and many of the things inside the ring did too. Well, you, you may wonder, well, why, why did things inside the ring go away? Because we use the same filtering criteria that the FAA uses to get rid of things that are either 15 nautical miles away from you or more than 3,500 feet plus or minus. So we know that all of the planes, uh, so when you take a look at it with the filter off, I'm gonna flick it back off again. You may think, oh my gosh, there's a lot of planes in the sky. Oh, danger, danger, Will Robinson. Well, you really don't have that much danger because most of those planes are not near you because when you tap the filter back on again, you find that almost all of them have gone away. You only really have three or four planes to worry about. So that's the power. We also have this other really cool feature called the buddy list. 
Um, I'm not going to demo this to you just because we're about out of time. But if you consistently fly with, say, if this guy's your buddy, N316TA, and you want to make sure that if you're flying in formation or just if you're looking out to see if he's flying that day, you can type his tail number and any other tail number you like into what we call the buddy list. You can learn how to do this in the uh, documentation with the product. In the buddy list, and it'll turn blue, meaning that all your buddies are blue, and no matter, even if you have the filter turned on and they're outside the filter area, you'll see them highlighted. Really slick feature. Okay, let's do a little bit about approach procedures. So as we're flying along here um, in our simulated flight, we are reasonably close to this airport right here, Dane County, 31 miles away. So I'm going to pull up an approach procedure for it. We're probably going to be a little bit too far away to see it unless we go to a high altitude uh, one. What I'm doing right now to flip procedures, by the way, is just flipping left and right back and forth. That's too bad. We're not close enough to see anything. Let's see if there is an airport close to us. Now, what I just did was I tapped on the airport here on the screen, which happens to be Watertown Muni. I know because of the icon that looks like a procedure that it has at least one approach procedure. If it didn't, like um, this airport down here, whatever a J3 Cub Field is, it doesn't have a procedure icon. Instead, it has an eye for information. So I'm going to go back to the Watertown Muni. I'm going to tap on the icon that looks like a procedure. And there you are. We're on a procedure. Although, there we go. So now you can see where you are. By the way, on these two, notice that it says note at the very top of the screen, no georeference information is available. That's because there's only one navigational point in NDB here. Uh, so there's not enough information for us to georeference it, which is pretty, which is, um, so on the older NDB approaches, or even on some VRs, it happens. If you're on an RNAV approach or anything newer, you see yourself flying on the approach plate, and it's pretty slick. I'm going to pick a different airport, though, just to show you more some of the other features that are applicable there. So I'm going to go back to my home airport pane with just a couple of taps. Now, this one has a lot more procedures. And if you decide you don't want to flick left and right to get to all of those, there's a button bar on the side here. I'm going to pick the choice that I highlighted that looks like a stack of papers. You can just click on those and pick the one you want through the list and jump immediately to it. It's a lot faster. Okay? So easy way to do that. You can also do this in split screen mode. So I'm going to tap the split screen button here in the corner. And I'm going to put on the left hand side, I'm going to go down to the tab bar there and select map and check this out. I'm going to, on this side, select procedures. So let's see. So we'll find the procedure at this airport, Watertown. And we'll pick the RNAV approach. So now you see the RNAV approach here. If I go back to my map, and back to my map, so here I am flying along. And let's say that I want to see, I'm going to turn the traffic off, by the way, too. So this is one of the other map layers that you can get to, traffic. There are a lot more they didn't have time to talk about, by the way, things like fuel prices that get color-coded on the screen for you, um, grids, obstacles, TAWs, course line, and so on. I'm going to turn the traffic off just to declutter this a little. But if I want to see this approach plate on the map itself, there's a button, a small map button, next to the approach plate on the right-hand side of the screen. When I tap that, then it goes on the map. What's really slick about this is, if right now we're on the RNAV for runway five, if the winds change and we need to switch approaches, I simply swipe on the right-hand side and look what happens on the left. It changes the approach plates to max the one that I have selected. Pretty slick, huh? Okay, let's get back maybe to our flight plan. I'm gonna go back to, I have to stop the presentation in a minute, but I, I just wanna show a couple of other things. So when we're back to our flight plan, our nav log here, if I want to see that on the screen, if I want to modify that, there's a lot of ways that you can modify this. And I go over all of these in the advanced presentation that you can see on YouTube. But the most common way to modify a flight plan is to do it with your finger. So if I press and hold anywhere on the line or on any existing point, I'm going to select a point uh, right about here. So I'm just going to press and hold. It turns into a circle. I can then move that 
somewhere else. Like if I move it to about oh, somewhere around here, I didn't directly land on an airport, but I came really close. So I can either pick an airport, if there's a nav aid, oh, I did miss on here. If you just get reasonably close to something, it will show you the different choices. So I'm just going to tap anywhere where it says prospect state, anywhere in the entire row, just select there, and the flight plan gets modified to move to it. Very simple, very, very easy way to move the map. So that should give you some sense of what you can use the Brock for. Again, this has just been an introductory class. There's a lot more detail and a lot more things that you can do with the Brock. And I would, to be honest with you, I would invite you uh, to look at the presentation, which is uh, tomorrow we're doing a present. Actually, John Ryder uh, is doing a presentation tomorrow, 6 p.m. Pacific time, which is the final presentation that we're giving. And that one is an advanced uh, class, has a lot of IFR stuff, a lot more ADSB stuff, and so on. And will also be interactive. If you missed, if you can make that one, you can also on YouTube watch the other presentation that I gave last night. So at this point, I'm going to get rid of the iPad stuff. I'm just going to go back to this. Okay. So again, there's a presentation. I should have listed this here, but there's a presentation tomorrow night, uh, which you can watch at six o'clock. And the presentations are all available right now on youtube.com slash flyqefb.